Thank you. Right, can you hear me at the back? Yeah. I'm sure you can hear me at the front. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk today, a sort of fairly general talk, about uh, an unusual device dating from about 100 BC. Um, the device is shown, a reconstruction of the device is shown on the right here, the Antikythera mechanism. It would have been about the size of a shoebox. You can guess what the uh, mechanism on the right is, which is also not much bigger than a shoebox. And if uh, there are some parallels I draw, it's obviously because of the nature of the audience today, but there are some parallels to be drawn. First of all, though, back to the classical world, to about 100 BC. Those of you who uh, lack a classical education, um, 100 BC was a, a time of change in the ancient world. The glory of Greece was to some extent behind us. That was maybe a few hundred years before. But the Roman Empire had yet to be declared. That was another 50 years in the future, although already Rome was conquering all around the Mediterranean. And from this time, a transition between the great Greek world and the great Roman world comes an artifact, a thing found in a shipwreck, um, which I was privileged to be involved in uh, a, a long uh, program of research to find out what the hell it was. Now, the Antikythera mechanism, and I'll show some pictures of it in a moment, or some more details of the actual bits, was found in a shipwreck. The shipwreck was found in uh, about uh, in nine, 1900, in other words, at the beginning of the last century, by some sponge divers uh, diving off the island of Antikythera. And I'll show where the island of Antikythera is in a minute. The, we're not quite sure when the mechanism was made. My guess is it was made sometime between about 150, 140 BC and uh, 80 BC, something like that, about 100 BC probably in the Mediterranean island of Rhodes, although my colleagues would probably argue with me about exactly where it was built. Here is a, a map of the Mediterranean, or the eastern part of the Mediterranean. Let's see, who, who's been to Athens? Right, there's Athens. Who's been to Crete on their holidays? Oh, you're a, you're a rich lot, you lot. Oh, right, okay, there's Crete. Uh, here's Rhodes. Anybody been to Rhodes? There we are. Gosh, you're a well-traveled lot. Now, here's the island of Kithara. And across the strait from Kithra is the island of Antikythera, which means opposite Kithra. And it was here the shipwreck was found. <laughs> These uh, sponge divers were going from their island where they lived in Simi across to uh, North Africa where they hunted for spongy sponges. Well, I don't know if you have to hunt them very carefully. You pick them up, I suppose. <laughs> anyway, uh, and they dived after sheltering from a storm and found the wreck of a Roman-era trading ship. And on that, uh, in among the, the, the stuff they found on that wreck, uh, there was subsequently a big, uh, really what was really the first proper underwater archaeological expedition was mounted in 1901 by the Greek Navy, uh, the, Greek, the National Archaeological Museum in Athens and uh, the Greek government to try and recover what they found. And in this wreck, there were all sorts of things. You know, statues, bronzes, glassware, all sorts of wonderful hoard. And if you ever go to Athens again, go and have a look at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, where all this stuff is. How many of them actually, those who went to Athens, anybody been to the National Archaeological Museum in Athens? Did you see the mechanism? We did. Good, okay. So, okay, so I, what I'm saying is true, okay? <laughs> in among these wonderful bronzes and all sorts of things, they found a lump of bronze. They probably thought it was something like a, the head of a statue or something, and it was it put into the museum in Athens. Subsequently, it broke up, probably because of shrinkage and also because of conservation work and so on, and it was noticed that it had gear wheels in it. Now, this is unusual because gear wheels were not known, from, or precision gear wheels were not known from the uh, ancient world. These are the remaining fragments. I'll just show, show that picture to show what remains of the fragments. It's sort of out as a jigsaw next Christmas. Um, here's the main fragment that survives, and one you may have seen in pictures. Just to give you some idea, here's one I made earlier with sticky back plastic. There we are. That's a model. That's life-size. 
Okay? That's it. That's the main fragment. This is, uh, uh, as I say, there are 82 other fragments, but about six big ones, and this by far is the most important of the big ones. Now, can you see here, there's a big wheel here, which I'll call the chariot wheel. It has nothing to do with chariots, but you know what I mean. Okay? Uh, it's, uh, it's the only one, in fact, that has that sort of chariot wheel structure. And there may be a reason for that, which I'll talk about later. Anyway, can you see there's a gear wheel here, a gear wheel here, and a gear wheel here. And I'll show in a minute or two, in fact, this big chariot wheel itself is a gear wheel. Now, as I say, this was a surprise. It wasn't clear, uh, to begin with, what this uh, collection of gears uh, was. Until about the 1960s, late 1960s, early 1970s, when the first radiography of the mechanism was made. And radiography of that fragment, that big fragment I just showed you, showed that the mechanism contained originally at least 30 gears. 30 gear wheels. Now, just to put that in context, it was known this was something from the classical world. Nothing like a 30-geared mechanism was known in history until the era of the medieval cathedral clocks around 1200 AD, well over a millennium later. So already, just the number of gear wheels and the fact there were gear wheels in this classical mechanism is highly unusual. And the number, of course, is already, I hope, boggling your minds. Okay. Not only did this mechanism have the first known gear wheels in, or precision gear wheels, it also had the first known scientific scales, or dials. There we are, there's another one, that's also, that's real size. Okay, if you go to Athens, you can see all these in the museum. There's it blown up, and uh, in fact it has scientific scales on it, I say these are first known, and they're not just a simple dial or something, they're in fact are quite complex, and we'll see these later on. This one, in fact, is essentially a spiral, a five-turn spiral dial. So it's a complicated mechanism with spiral dials on. But if I go to the final... Uh, Fragment I'm going to show in detail. Well, actually, I'll show some more later. Um, there we are. That size. Cruelly enlarged here. But look at this. Can you see this beautiful engraving? There's a, there's a, fine, a finer scientific scale as you'll have seen for a while. Okay? In that. And you'll also notice the, the bronze plate with which the mechanism is covered. Can you notice anything here? Okay? You can noti notice Greek script. I'd have worried if it was acrylic or in English, but no, it's, it's Greek, fortunately. Okay. <coughs> so the mechanism has gears, it has inscriptions, uh, it has dials. So what was it? Well, before we started work, there had been a long history of, uh, since obviously since 1900, of people beginning to look at the mechanism, but it's really around the year 2004 that a... a uh, Collaboration was put together involving scientists and others from uh, the UK, scientists and mathematicians, involving astronomers, involving epigraphers, they're people who look at letters on such devices, or, well, not on such devices, but on letters in general in Greek, uh, archaeologists, and two industrial concerns. One, the XTEC, which was a, a maker of precision X ray machines. Uh, for industrial purposes, also Hewlett Packard in the United States, who I'm going to show they had a little group that worked on uh, optical imaging, and more recently we've been joined by various uh, his historians of science from the United States. Uh, so it's this lot who've done all the work, not me. Now, we did two things. First, one of the most important things to do was to try and get the to take something like this big fragment and find out what the hell was actually inside it. What was actually inside it? It was known from some clues, which I'll give in a minute, that the mechanism was probably astronomical in purpose. We'd already picked that up. Other people had already picked that up. But what really lay inside this? This drops on your desk. How do you start investigating it? Well, as I say, there's been some radiographs uh, already taken of it in the 1970s. What we wanted to do was to do X-ray computed tomography. 
which is equivalent to a body scan. You've seen these scans of bodies or scans of brains. Basically, we wanted to put it in one of those to be able to get three-dimensional uh, information about wh what was inside. And if you're trying to investigate something, if you have some function, idea of function, what I'm going to emphasize for today's purposes is what you need is information on function, you need background information on what you're looking for, and clues that will give you the crack in so that you can interpret. Okay? That's, uh, you've probably heard that in other circumstances. It's, it's, it's common investigative technique, really, for anything. Okay, so we borrowed, very kindly, from a firm called Xtech in Tring, who are an industrial corporation, who made scanners for looking at things like uh, turbine blades in jet engines and printed circuits, very high-precision X-ray stuff. Now, it's no good putting this in uh, a uh, body scanner in a hospital. It's f the, the sort of X-rays you need to penetrate this are much stronger than you would need to penetrate the human body. And they had scanners like that. They called them the Blade Runner machines, and uh, they, they very kindly lent us their highest energy ever machine and allowed us to use it for these investigations. They supplied staff to do that. They were fantastic. Um, it, it benefited them in the end because I believe they sold 17 of these machines on the back of the research, so <laughs> they got their money back, all right. Um, now, what I would have liked to have done is just put these fragments in, into a briefcase in uh, Athens, get on a plane, bring them back to Tring in Hertfordshire, where this company was, and put it in the machine. The Greeks weren't too keen on that. <laughs> I never mentioned the word Elgin or marble, <laughs> but... Uh, this thing is very, very, very fragile, these things. And they, they insist that they do not move from the museum <coughs> in Athens. And they're absolutely right. They shouldn't. They're far too precious to move. And so the only way to do that was to take the machine down to Athens. So this machine was loaded onto a low loader and driven down through Europe, through the streets of Athens in the early morning, motorcycle outriders and everything. Great fun. And brought into the basement of the museum in Athens. And if you're asking, yes, we did measure this doorway before going down there. And it turned out very successfully to be able to plot uh, the interior of this mechanism. Now, here's a sort of x-ray, uh, just a direct x-ray through it. You can already see it's pretty complicated. But it doesn't really give an idea of the structure. And as with all things, if you can, there's a one-dimensional construction. Get what you can out of that. If you can get three dimensions, you're going to do better. Okay? So, here is a... What, uh, I'll just hope this works. It's an embedded video, so you never know with these things, but I'll just check that it is working. Oops. That's it. Okay. I'll set it going. It takes a moment or two to, to work. What this is, is a reconstruction from the, the x-rays, and we're just going to go right down, we're just going to scan right down in planes through the fragment, okay? So we're going to go down through the mechanism. And I think you see from this how this helps you. Now, here we begin to get to the big wheel on the front, the chariot wheel. Now, what I want you to see here that it is indeed a gear wheel. Come on, you can do it. Has that hung? There we are. Can you see the teeth? Okay. That outer wheel has 223 teeth on it. Now, why 223? We'll come to that later. Okay. As we go down, I hope you can begin to see uh, more stuff appearing, if it doesn't keep hanging up, which it's trying to do. I'll have to stand over there and pump it. Okay, we're going down. Can you see the shaft in the middle there? Complex shaft right in the middle of the, of the gear wheel there. <coughs> going down. More gears. More gears. Some sort of plate holding the thing together. Shafts going through it. And as we go down, more gears. A sort of funny horseshoe spacer. Gears with pins in to keep them in. Bigger gears. An even bigger, huge gear there with teeth on. Double row of teeth. Gears mounted on gears. More gears. 
Okay, I won't labour the thing, but you get the idea. If you can get that sort of three-dimensional structure, you can begin to get some idea of function. The first thing I wanted to do when we got the, this information was to find out what the count of teeth on these gears are. If you're looking for function, if we, if we know the teeth on the different gear wheels, numbers of teeth, you can start looking for ratios, relationships, and begin to work out what goes on. This is an interesting challenge, and one that may be familiar to some of you in crypto cryptographic uh, uh, um, applications. Here's a typical gear wheel from the thing, although some of them are complete, a few gears are complete, most of them are broken. So you've got incomplete information. Uh, and there's a problem too here, is that these gears were probably cut by hand with a file. So they're not, when they were made, they weren't regular entirely. So how do you get reliable teeth counts? Well, it wasn't actually as difficult as you might think. You, 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 we did a bit of mathematics and a bit of statistical analysis, basically looking at the, uh, how the angular position of the gear teeth relative to the centre. And you can show, in fact, you can, you can account for the fact you don't know the centre exactly. You can manage that. And essentially do a sort of statistical analysis based essentially on at least squares fit to how many teeth there were on, on the gear wheel. And surprisingly, you can do remarkably well. We got most gears, we knew the exact teeth count. Most gears. Some we knew within one, some within two. Which isn't bad. And here are the numbers of the teeth that we counted. I've just highlighted a couple here that might be interesting numbers for you. Um, some of them are fairly expected numbers. If you're making a gear wheel, do it simply, divide it carefully. But there's some that may be a little unusual. How about 53 for a tooth? Not perhaps what you might expect. Why 53? And it, the important thing was, these statistical methods show it was 53. It wasn't 52, and it wasn't 54. It was 53. <coughs> Again, looking for decoding something. If you know something that's odd, but you're sure is right, that's a real clue. Okay. There's some other ones here. 127, you've got your primes going. That's a nice prime. 188, it's an interesting number as well. Some of these, 223 I've already mentioned on the main gear, we know 223 is an astronomical cycle, and I'll come back to that one in a minute. So getting the gear teeth and some geometric relation to them, you're beginning to get to understand what the mechanism would do. And here is our reconstruction of the gear train. Uh, my colleagues, particularly a, a mathematician filmmaker called Dr. Tony Freeth, did some excellent work in, in working out where these gears uh, were situated. Um, Here's our reconstruction of the device. The red gears are the gears that still survive. There are a few missing. Those, the only bit that's missing in this gear train are those green gears there. And we can see from the mechanism that there are broken off shafts there. And the gears we have to think that would be there are indeed the right size for the right number of teeth to do what they think they did. So we're confident in our reconstruction of that small bit there. But the rest of this survives. Um, and it feeds to the, a front face, which I'll talk about in a minute, and a back face with dials on. And the whole thing works by having a, a crown gear here, which drives the chariot wheel, which you turn by hand using a knob or something on the side of the mechanism. And it drives all these gear trains to drive these various dials. So it might have looked something like this when it was actually in operation. On the front here... Uh, there is a, a, a double dial uh, an, which really shows the zodiac in the sky. Now, let me remind you what the zodiac is. How many of you know what your birth sign is? How many don't know what your birth <coughs> sign is? Well done, sir. I'm glad you're not swayed by these strange astrological predictions. Okay, now... It's interesting, you all know what your birth, or nearly all know what your birth sign is. And it costs the idea of, uh, uh, I, I get to talk very, very vaguely about astrology. Okay? Astrology, uh, uh, before, uh, I do private consultations for a lot. No, no, I don't. <laughs> um, one has to understand, of course, in the classical world, astrology and astronomy were more interweaved than they are today. I mean, uh, most astronomers today will have absolutely nothing to do with astrology, me included, I hasten to add. But you have to understand that, that, that there is some historical 
belief systems and background in astrology that we, we have to just have a little look at it as we go through. Um, you know, in decoding something, you have to be aware of all the facts or of all the background, okay? Um, however, I will emphasize that this mechanism was not really an astrological mechanism. It was an astro astronomical mechanism, as I'll try and show. Now, as I say, there's, there's a, a thing here which gives the 12 signs of the zodiac which you know, correspond to your birth signs. What does that mean? I'm sure many of you know this, but some won't. What it means is, the Earth goes around the Sun. In those days, this is a geocentric device. They assumed the Sun went around the Earth, but it doesn't matter. So obviously, it's this. I mean, geocentric is much more sensible than heliocentric. You know, I'm, we, you know, can you feel yourself moving around the Sun at the moment? No. Can you feel it? No. Why isn't all the, you know, and it's, you know, much better. It's it's like the Leave campaign, you know. It's, anyway, uh, we... <laughs> um, your, your birth sign, your birth sign is, as we go around the sun, if you imagine, here's the Earth going around the sun, okay. The sun at any time will be blocking out part of the sky beyond itself, compared with you, okay. And that, there'll be a ring of the sky around the sun which gets blocked out at different times during the year. And you say the sun is in that part of the sky, corresponding to that part of that band, which is called the zodiac. And when you were born, that part of the sun, that part of the sky that was being blocked out by the sun, is what your birth sign is. So if you're a, a Taurus, do we have Tauruses here? Right, okay. The Taur Taurus, then the sun was in, in May time blocking that part of the sky. And it, that's where it comes from. And those signs are around this dial, and here is a little pointer with a little golden sphere on it, which would show where the sun was in the sky during the year. Okay. Also on the front here are planetary indicators. Now I'll come back to this. When we started work, it certainly was not clear whether this mechanism did show planets or not. And the problem is that the part of the mechanism which might have shown planets is missing. Presumably it was, was damaged in the, in the shipwreck or whatever fell off in the shipwreck. I'll come back to that because I'm, for, for reasons I'm going to tell you later on, we're sure that it did show the planetary positions. It was quite a complicated device. Okay, on the back of the device here, there were two spiral dials. They're quite complicated. As I say, it was a five-turn spiral on the top and a four-turn spiral on the bottom. The realisation that this uh, was a double spiral on the back here in fact, uh, the realisation it was a double spiral dial was not due to us, it was due to a guy called Michael Wright, a very, very able a guy who works in London still, and he used to be a, a curator of mechanical engineering at the Science Museum. And he'd already realised from, from the work he'd been doing that these indeed were spirals. That they're not true spirals, they're actually made up of semicircles shifted slightly. They're sort of nested semicircles to get a spiral. It's quite a clever way of getting a whole lot of information onto a, a dial uh, um, in, in a small space. And I'll say more about that in a minute. Okay, here is, as I say, here is one of those spiral dials on the back of the mechanism. And uh, to give you some idea of what those might be uh, about, here's another of the fragments. Uh, I rather like to call this the Isle of Wight fragment. You can guess why. <laughs> anyway, just a small fragment, it's about that size, okay, with this uh, Greek writing on now, another of the techniques we used, apart from the computed tomography, was uh, developed by Hewlett Packard, particularly a guy called Tom Maltzbender, in the United States. And it's a way of looking at surfaces in order to see faint detail. Now, I won't labour labor the point. Basically, what you do is you, you have a... Uh, I don't think I've got a... No, I haven't, I don't think I've got a big picture of it, the device here. But you, you put the... Uh, whatever it is you want to examine down, and you have a device that has 50 flashlights and a, a, a camera, electronic camera, elect, you know, digital camera, and a small computer with very smart software. And you fire off those 50 lights one at a time, take a picture each time, combine it in the computer, and then take the information, the data away. And in your computer, you can then look at the fragment and relight it by using your different di digital images. It's a very powerful way of looking for details on surfaces. How many of you used to be Time Team addicts? There are enough people here. Surely, who, who watched Time Team? 
Come on, admit it. Okay. Well, if those of you who have ever, ever watched Time Team or one of those archaeological programs, you'll know if you want to see faint lumps and bumps on the ground, when's the best time to do it? Sunrise or sunset from above? Because the grazing incidents will bring out faint detail. And that's basically, this is a very sophisticated system for relighting and re-imaging in order to be able to see faint detail. Now, I believe that the, the technique has been used. They, they used it, they, the, the, the police were interested, and um, they believed a, a, a killer had signed a confession on a piece of paper and ripped it off a pad. And they were able, by relighting the, what was left on the pad, to bring out the faint detail of the confession. I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but so Tom always tells me that was one of his applications of this. So that sort of thing, to show you what you can do with that sort of uh, technology, there's the original fragment as it looks if you looked at it, and there it is after a bit of this relighting and image processing on it. Now, on here, you will immediately notice, the Greek scholars among you, that there are three numbers on this fragment. I'll zoom in. There's the number 76... 19 and 223 in Greek. Now, you immediately see the implication of this. Well, you might if you knew a lot of classical astronomy. It's not the sort of stuff we teach necessarily in astrophysics degrees these days, and I don't think our students would do very well on it. But these are very fundamental numbers in terms of ancient astronomy. They're still relevant today. Again, this is a classic case when you're decoding something. If you know something, if you know something, some numbers, some symbols, some words that might be used, if you can spot them, then you're beginning to understand what's going on. And these numbers are interesting. Um, 19 is the number of years in a metonic cycle. What is a metonic cycle, you may ask? Well... It's a cycle of the sun and the moon. It's named after a guy called Meton, who brought across into the Greek world around 400 BC or so a lot of knowledge that had been uh, gained by the Babylonians through watching the sky visually, no telescopes at this time, visually, over hundreds of years. And the Babylonians had um, recorded a whole lot of stuff on clay tablets. I don't know, have I got a clay tablet under here? I probably have. With luck. There, there's a clay tablet. Okay, be something about like this size. If you want to go to the British Museum and ask to have a look at some, they've got thousands. Okay, and the Babylonians over hundreds of years recorded astronomical cycles, just watching the sky time after time after time. And in that, they, they recognized that there were certain cycles in the sky, and the metonic one of 19 years is a very useful one at tying together the motion of the moon with the motion of the sun. Now, how many lunar months, full moon to full moon, are there in a year? Ish. 13-ish. Okay, the problem is it's not an integer. Okay, that's really annoying. Because otherwise you could schedule, you know, you've got your, you know, you want your birthday barbecue, you could always set it on the same date. If the full moon was there, you know, you'd have the full moon for your barbecue or whatever. You can't do that because the moon wanders. Now, particularly in ancient times, this was important because they did, uh, there, there were things they wanted to do, bring crops in whenever the sun, moon was out and so on, but particularly religious festivals they wanted to celebrate on new moon or uh, full moon. And so they really wanted a much better uh, knowledge of when the full moon or new moon fell during the year. But you can't... The, it's not integer ratio, so it's difficult to say. But you can, there is a, a cycle that helps you. What's the date today? 22nd of June, right? What's the moon, so what's the moon at the moment? Yeah, it's, it's just past full, I think, isn't it? Full was a couple of nights ago, because it was an unusual moon on the solstice. Okay, so it's two days past full moon. 22nd of June. If you come here in 19 years, on the 22nd of June, don't forget... 19 years time on the 22nd of June. It will also be two days past full moon. Okay? Now, if you've got that, you can fill in all the stuff in between. Just a way of harmonising the two cycles. And in fact, 76 is what's called um, a calypic cycle. And that is, in fact, four... Th four? Yes, four. No, three. Four. 
four, um, yes, four, four metronic cycles minus one day, because that's even more accurate as a relationship. Two, two, three. Anybody? It's the number of lunar months in a Seros cycle of eclipses. If you have a lunar eclipse one month, say, when would it occur? New moon or full moon? Lunar eclipse? Eclipse of the moon must occur at full moon. Okay? So if you have a, a, a lunar eclipse, say one month, 223 lunar months later, there will be an almost exactly similar eclipse, but shifted in time by eight hours. That's the Seros. Also happens for solar eclipses too. So if you've got a table of ancient eclipses, or <coughs> eclipses in the past, you can predict when eclipses are, are not will happen, but are likely to happen in the future. Now, I've got calendrical data here about the sun and the moon. I've got um, the Seros cycle of eclipses. Obviously, this is on the mechanism. It implies an astronomical function. This has been known since not long after 1900. Okay. But how these things were displayed was not clear before our work started. We quite soon read out of the ancient Greek the following thing. A spiral divided into 235 sections. Now, we'd seen 19. 19 years corresponds to 235 lunar months. So seeing this inscription, 235, bingo! It's the metonic cycle. So we knew from this that one of those spiral dials must, must display this metonic cycle uh, relating the, the sun and the moon uh, and lunar months. And indeed, this is what the back of the mechanism roughly would have looked like, something like this, with a, a dial at the top with the 235 months of the lunar cycle and the bottom one with 223 divisions showing this Seros cycle of eclipses. And I mentioned that. Point. Now, you might wonder, this, this is, as I say, this is a neat little thing, this. You know, it's the laptop version with good, good little dars. Um, 235 divisions around a, s a single circle would be difficult to read. I think you'd agree. I'd find trouble with 60 seconds. I'm glad you've got a digital clock, otherwise you might be in trouble. Anyway, uh, it's difficult. So 235 right around. But you say, well, how do you know? How do you know which of these divisions to look at? They thought of that. This dial, the black here, the continuous line here, is not just a line, it's a slot, it's a cut slot in the metal face. A cut spiral slot. And the pointer was designed so that it fitted with a point into the slot and was free to move in and out at that end. If I put it here, there's the thing that goes in the slot, and here's the device that allows it to go in and out. So you put the pointer in, say, at the beginning here, and as it winds round, it actually pulls the arm out. Do you remember, like, the old vinyl gramophone records? Well, they still are. They're modern now, aren't they? Pulls it across. So you just look at the end of the pointer, and it'll actually tell you not, it, not, not only which division to look at, but on the right spiral. That's a nice little bit of engineering, that. Sorry, can I just remind you, this is around 100... BC. This is what's so surprising. Okay. Okay. So let's have a look at the gear trains in more uh, more detail because they are quite interesting and quite uh, surprising. Here is the drive to this top. This is the, the dial at the top that shows you the metonic cycle. You turn here. The, this wheel, this chariot wheel, is is equivalent to turning once a year. One year is one turn of that chariot wheel. And that drives, 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 and pushes the pointers around. Okay? Straightforward drive to the top dial there. Interestingly enough, on this dial too, there's a little tiny sub-dial there, which was rather interesting, we found, because it actually has got some names on. Can anybody read this? Nemea? Olympia. Yeah! He's there already. So what's Olympia? The Olympic Games. Now, Nemea is a, a Pan-Hellenic games cycle which was held every two years and there are also the NAR games and the Isthmian games. It's a dial on the front to tell you which games is being held that year. How we didn't make money on this when the Olympics were on, I don't know, but we didn't. <laughs> there we are. 
Um, so that's interesting. What the hell is a dial doing on this mechanism to tell the Olympic Games or the Panhellenic Games cycle? Does this imply some sort of social function for this device? Or is it perhaps a way of orienting you in terms of years in a world where everywhere had its different calendar? Across the ancient world, lots of different calendars, lots of different dates, whatever. But you'd probably know which games were on. Euro, whatever it was, that particular <laughs> year. Okay? So it may be that. But it was surprising anyway. And interestingly enough, fairly recently it's been noticed that in fact there's a faint inscription just here which has the Hallie, well, I'm not very good at pronouncing Greek, pronounce it how you like. This was a game which was held in Rhodes. It's a small game, but held in Rhodes. And it's another reason why we think the thing might have been made in Rhodes, that this rather small game is mentioned on this dial. The bottom of the dial, spiral dials, as I say, that shows when a, an eclipse is likely. And there are little glyphs on here, as we call them, uh, little signs that where in, in a month it's like there's either a lunar or a um, solar eclipse will occur. There's in, even, in fact, another little dial. Do you remember I said that the cycle is it's, uh, 223 months plus eight hours each time? So if you go eight hours, another cycle, eight hours, another cycle, eight hours, you've done three cycles and got back to the same time. And in fact, you can use this for three cycles, and there's a little dial in here, it's called an exiligmos cycle, there's a little dial here to show you which of those three cycles you would be in. Okay. Now, the, how does that drive? Well, in comes the drive here. We've seen that it drives that once a year, that to that to that, along here to this huge great turntable dial. It dials on that, it drives there. There's a second set of teeth, it drives off there, drives there, drives there, drives there, drives there. And that drives the bottom dial. We first, when we first worked this out, we were a little sniffy about this. That's not very elegant, we said. Not very good at this, the Greeks. <laughs> Big mistake. Big mistake. Do not underestimate the Greeks. Okay. <laughs> but beware of them bearing gifts. As they are. Okay. As we shall see, this is not a mistake. It's much more interesting than that. And we just couldn't understand why they'd use this huge gear here. But it'll come back in a minute. Okay. What you'll notice is, on this gear, there are some other gears mounted. What's called epicyclic gearing. Gears mounted upon gears. Now, again, Michael Wright, who I mentioned before, had noticed that these gears, they're very small gears, they're only about this sort of size. One of the gears mounted on this thing has a slot in it. I don't know if you can see it on here. Here's part of the gear. There's a slot there. If I go to an x-ray of it, you perhaps see it better. Can you see there's a slot with a pin in it? Can you see the slot and there's a pin? Why? What's, what's this little bit of gearing doing? Let me ask you the following thing. If you go out from night to night and look up at the sky, and look at the moon, if you go out, say, each night at, say, 8 o'clock, new moon, see it over there. Night later, you'll see it there at the same time. Night later, you'll see it there at the same time. Am I familiar with, are you familiar with this? Few people are nodding sagely, the rest of you are looking completely and utterly blank. Because you haven't done this, have you? This is your homework. Okay? When the next new moon comes, you go out at the same time each night, and look south, and see each night at the same time where the moon is. And you'll see the moon goes there, next night there, next night there, next night there. As it gradually waxes, sorry, yes, waxes up to, to full moon. Now, Question is, does it move the same distance every night? <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> now, the answer is no. Okay? If the orbit of the moon were a circle, it would. Right? But the orbit of the moon isn't a circle. Now, the Greeks didn't know this. The Greeks didn't realize that the orbits were ellipses. Goodness knows why. They had the maths to do it. But they never realised. They, they were too tied up, probably, with the idea that the circle is perfect. And so they tried to represent this by circles rolling on circles things. But I won't go into it. But we know that it's an ellipse. And that means that sometimes the moon is further away and moving slower, and sometimes it's nearer and moving faster. Which means that sometimes it moves slightly further, sometimes slightly less in the sky from night to night. 
Now, suppose you, the Greeks knew about this motion. They didn't know it was due to ellipses. Suppose you wanted to put that into mechanical form. How would you do it? Okay. How about the following? Have a drive which drives a gear wheel which drives another gear wheel. This gear wheel has a peg in it and the peg pushes on a slot in a gear wheel above it. So what will happen is this turn, it turns this upper gear. However, you will notice this upper gear is slightly off-centre with regard to this gear. So this turns round, but that's slightly off-centre. You pick off the motion and take it away. Now, as that drives round, sometimes the pin is slightly closer to the centre of the upper gear and sometimes slightly further away. So if it's driving uniformly, what will happen to the top gear? Sometimes it will drive a little faster, sometimes a little slower. So what you're doing then is putting in a constant speed and it's coming out sort of sinusoidal. And would you believe those four gears on that turntable are such as to give you just the difference of motion of the moon from night over a, over a, over a, a, a monthly cycle. So what happens in driving the moon indicator on the front here is you turn the thing. How often does this go around? You know, somebody's awake, good. Once a year, okay. That drives, that drives, that drives, that drives, that drives, that. It goes through here and drives this variable speed mechanism, which I've just talked about, and back through here, back through here, back through here, and onto the front. Okay. And the coup de grace, you remember I mentioned those big gears which we couldn't understand? This mechanism is mounted on this big gear. This big gear is turning. What this does is take account of the fact, you know I said the moon's orbit was an ellipse, but it's a three-body problem. It's the Earth, the moon, and the, and the sun. That causes the ellipse to process. So it looks, you know, if you looked at it over a period of time, it looked like a pretty flower pattern. It's exaggerated. Which means that the period at which this variation occurs is not the normal lunar period, it's a slightly different one. Because the thing's processing. By mounting these gears on this other gear, <coughs> they reproduce that other time scale as well as the actual variation. Sorry, your minds are boggling, but you get the idea? It's, <laughs> it's a brilliant bit of mechanical design. You've got uh, interleaved gear trains with a variable speed mechanism. This is not what we expected of the Greeks. Sh we should have done. Okay? And it's, uh, this is what you know, this study has added to, to, to realise that the standard of mechanical design in, Greek in ancient Greek science is much, much higher than we'd ever imagined. Very clever stuff. Why, we, why you don't accept it, I don't know, because you know, obviously a classical man was just as, a uh, classical man and woman was just as intelligent as present day uh, men and women. Okay. So here's the sort of, uh, just a coloured diagram, as I say. Those are the ones, that, that, that's the driving train, that's to the, that one, that's to that one, and that's to the uh, sun and moon display on the front. Okay, so what's important about this? have got a few minutes left. Uh, it's based on Babylonian period relationships. The astronomy is just what they knew in 140 to 100 BC. Zion's superb. And where we've got some literature accounts, which I'll mention very briefly in a moment, they probably underestimate the technical complexity of what was going on. Okay. Now, more recently, I'll just mention we've looked at the, the, here's a sort of exploded diagram with what we've got remaining of the inscriptions on this diagram. This is one of our uh, uh, surprising um, things, that using the surface imaging and the computed tomography, we were able to read much more of the script on this mechanism than had ever been read before. We started off with about, I think, 700 or so symbols known. Through the tomography and the surface imaging, we're now up, I think, about 3,000 characters. So basically, we've got a new astronomical text out of this mechanism. And just this month is published uh, uh, a, a, a volume of the journal Almagest, all about the inscriptions of the Antikythera mechanism. 280 pages of it. Soon to be a bestseller. Buy your copy now. Okay. And what, it sh what these inscriptions have shown, again, it's, you know, use every bit of information you can. It's certain that the planets were shown in this device. In fact, here's part of the back cover, and I'm just showing on here where the various planets are mentioned. And that sort of order is, is the sort of classic, uh, a classic representation of the solar system. And it is describing what you see on the front face. But that bit's missing, as I say. It would have probably had at least 30 gears or so in it as well, so, but that is missing. Uh, 
It's my colleagues Tony Freeth and Alex Jones did a reconstruction, their, their sort of reconstruction of what the thing might have looked like with full gearing. Um, the texts on this mechanism are very similar to a book by a guy called Geminos, who wrote a book around 50 BC about astronomy. So they, they two, the, the two texts smell the same, if I can put it that way. Again, it, rooting it nicely in its period. It's exactly what the Greeks knew of astronomy at that time. It looks as though there are at least two people engraving on this mechanism. So it's made by more than one person. There's probably a little workshop doing this. And there's just a hint of astrology. It starts mentioning things about the eclipse having a colour, whether it was red or black or whatever, which hints to us that maybe there's some sort of omen stuff hanging over from Babylon in this, that, you know, you want an eclipse with a particular colour, they're trying to predict it, which might have had just a whiff of astro astrology in it. But I emphasise again, we've looked all the time for astrological stuff in this. It isn't mainly astrological, it's mainly astronomical, this mechanism. OK, now I'll just uh, end with a few conjectures. I think spheri like this, as they're called, they're called spheri, were wildly known about, widely known about during the period of classical world. And I think they had a major development in the way people thought about the universe. And by that I mean, look, this mechanism was causal, deterministic, regular. It had regular irregularity. Good Rumsfeld is in that. A regular irregularity. <laughs> and uh, it had a single prime mover. You turn the handle and everything worked. Now that's a view of looking at the universe, which to some extent I think is... Um, is uh, the beginnings of uh, a mechanical scientific view of the universe. I'll just, I can't resist this. This is my fridge magnet at home. It also demonstrates exactly the same, same things. <laughs> okay. Um, of course, it was disputed as well in classical times that although this is a mechanical view of the universe, a lot of people didn't like a mechanical view of the universe. But it was the grit, I mean, it was grit in the oyster that began to make this uh, view happen. So three levels of engagement. You can have a magic machine that shows things. It could be a demonstration device to show what goes on in the heavens. But maybe it makes you think, perhaps they're gears in the cosmos that make it. Well, of course, they aren't really gears in the cosmos, but it provides an example, something that you could get your hands around, that you think, well, maybe things work like that. OK, they don't really, it's not really gears, but there's something else that makes the cosmos work in a mechanical way. And that, to my mind, is the dawning of real <coughs> beginnings of, of sorting out uh, modern views of the universe. Here, you're not meant to read all these. These are references in classical literature to devices like the Antikythera machine. Sometimes you think, well, it's just there, and it, how do you know it's genuine? There's lots of references in classical literature to such devices. Um, there's a guy called Galen, who you may have heard about, a medical guy in the, uh, uh, around the time, who talks about these models as whether they're like parts of the body or not. He discusses the body. Does the body work like a geared mechanism? No. Um, and I just mentioned this was 500 AD. Look, read it out. Shown how the moon recovers from waning and set turning by a visible mechanism, a tiny device, a portable sky, a compendium of the universe, a mirror of nature which reflects the heavens. What's that? That's the Antikythera mechanism, isn't that? Okay, so they were still around, around 500 AD. What happened then? Well, there's just hints that the technology survived. That here's a geared sundial from 520 AD. Here's a text in the Arabic world from around 900 AD. You can see gear wheels again. Here's a very fine um, geared astrolabe in the uh, Museum of Science in Oxford, if you want to go and look at it. It's around 1221. It was made in Istafan in the Arabic world. That's sort of just south of um, uh, Tehran here. So that probably some of the technology had moved into the Arabic world. Um, I won't go into the device. And then we get to around... 1280 AD, where somebody discovered the escapement mechanism that allows you to make regulated clocks. The escapement mechanism is the thing that does this. Tick, tock, tick, tock. Measures regular intervals of time that then allows you to make a mechanical clock. It's the first time it had been done. We don't know who did it or where. Probably northern Italy around this time. And once that happened, there was an explosion in uh, clock building and astronomical clock building in the UK, Richard of Wallingford did some stuff. I'll mention a guy in Italy called Giovanni de Donde in 1364. He produced a machine and also wrote it up, which was good of him, so there is a, a, a paper existing. 
uh, which included 107 gears. And here's a reconstruction of it. Here's another reconstruction of it. Beautiful device. This is the first thing we know about that was more complicated than the Antikythera mechanism. But it's from 1360-ish uh, AD. Rapid development of gear shapes, once uh, that happens, pre-1250, they're all, always pretty much triangular teeth. Uh, beyond that, you've got much better teeth and so on. Uh, I won't go into that. Okay, just looking forward from the Donde, go forward from that, and Johannes Kepler, who you will have heard of, my aim is to show that the heavenly machine is not a defined kind of divine live being, but a kind of clockwork. Okay, now we're really getting to the mechanical universe. And here's a clock from 1554, 1560. Does that look familiar, the front of that clock? It almost looks like an antikythera mechanism. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. Now, um, then you go on to Newton and so on, and mechanical ideas of the universe, which you're familiar with. Um, I'll just mention very quickly in the last couple of minutes, there is, in fact, there's been a, a return to antikythera now. Woods Hole Oceanographic, uh, along with uh, Greek ministries, are beginning to re-dive the site of the wreck to try and see if they can find other bits. They hopefully will find the planetary mechanism or perhaps even another machine if this was being shipped, which is what we think it was being delivered to somebody, perhaps there's another one. Perhaps there's a whole crater then down there with DHL on the side, you know, <laughs> I, uh, which would be great. But uh, watch this space because there's, there are seasons of them trying to, you can see there's a spear they found uh, fairly recently. So there's a tradition of astronomical mechanism for each five, 600 years. What else could they do? Okay, um, these are abacuses or counting tables. Could they have made a adding machine or a, a mathematical, you know, subtracting? Because this, the Antikythera mechanism is doing ratioing, so could they have built a... And the answer is it looks like no, because they hadn't... The actual errors in the gearing in the Antikythera museum mechanism is good enough for what he wants to do, but not good enough for precise mathematics. And I have a suspicion that Spiros <coughs> in the Greece would not have been happy if his if his drachmas were wrong, if the, or the Roman, Romans would not have liked machines that didn't give accurate calculation. They, they could have done it if they'd just done a little bit more, but it looks as though they didn't. It wasn't until about uh, 1623 that we again get a glimpse into mechanical calculation when Schickar, the guy, wrote to Kepler, the guy we were just talking about, with a sort of sketch for a geared adding machine. Pascal dabbled in these things around 1642 and produced a, a sort of mechanical calculator. And you all know about Babbage, I guess, by uh, 1832. Here's a bit of his machine, but he never completed it. I'm, uh, I'm sure you'll, m most of you know about Babbage, but it wasn't really until later in the century that you began to get proper mechanical machines uh, that calculated. Just on the way here, anyway, just just, if you're interested in Babbage and the thing, two good books, The Cogwheel Brain. How many read The Cogwheel Brain? Anybody? That's not a bad book about Babbage. And a wonderful graphic novel has just been published. If you like graphic novels, this is great, about Babbage and Lovely. It's absolutely, uh, you know, riotous and has a lot of good science in it, actually. has just been published. Okay, so these sort of things are beginning to get almost uh, familiar to me now, although the device was for rather different purposes, but nevertheless still used some uh, cogwheels, etc. <coughs> And I'm sure all of you who are interested in these things have read Andrew's... Ho How many people have read Andrew Hodge's book? Good. The rest should. Okay. So I'll stop now with this last slide, uh, which is from classical times. Um, somebody posted on the web the other day. It is a classical set, I think about 100 BC. Um, we are a little worried <laughs> <laughs> exactly what this represents. In fact, it's probably just a little case. And it's not true that, indeed, there is a laptop <laughs> in there. So if you want to look at our website to get more references and more details, there it is, and uh, I'll mention a review paper I published about a year or two ago that will give you most of what I said in my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Uh, it was being transported. That's why it was on the ship. Okay. What, it, what it was actually used for is still a mystery to some extent. We don't know. Was it a sort of teaching apparatus? Uh, maybe. Was it something you'd have in a temple? as you say, for ecumenical use or something, maybe. Was it really something that, I, the thing I think is, it was a statement. It's, it's a thing perhaps a rich man would want on his, on his mantelpiece or something, say, I know about the universe. Even if he didn't, at least it impresses his friends. Um, it's a statement about what they knew about astronomy and how things worked. I think that's probably what it is. Uh, um, none the worse for that. But we, we have no, nobody has, we've never found a, a reference in literature that says, there was this, you know, spheri because we have them to show so and so, or because whatever. We'd love to find something like that, but we don't. But probably, most likely, it could have been a teaching tool. It could have been a statement. What it isn't is an accurate calculator for the astronomer. An astronomer with a good pencil or piece of paper or stylus or whatever they use then um, could do much better using paper and pencil or whatever. But it's a good demonstration machine, and it's a, a, a brilliant bit of engineering to show how the heavens work. An excellent thought. <laughs> Can you guess how many were made? Uh, more than a few. Uh, less than, I don't know, less than a thousand, I guess. would be. But that's a pure guess. I believe we have evidence that people knew about them over a period of 700 <coughs> years, and I don't know how many you need to do that. Obviously, this wasn't the first one. You don't, this isn't the first thing you build. There's a whole, obviously, a a family going up to, to build something this complicated. So um, enough for people around the classical world to know about them. So I don't know, a few hundred, but that's pure guesswork. The, this, is, this is a very interesting question. The question is, Tol Ptolemy talked about, you remember I talked about wheels, circles moving on circles, and uh, the, what's called the epicyclic system for the, for the universe. How is this related to that is, I think, the question. Um, again, we don't know. Y this particular mechanism, you didn't see the gearing while the thing worked, while you did it. So, and we don't know how they did the planets, and they wouldn't necessarily have done it directly in exactly the same way that Ptolemy would have described it. There are easier ways to probably do that. Um, but... There has been the suggestion that <coughs> such devices, geared devices, working on planetary explanations, sort of fed into the mathematics and vice versa. It's been suggested, in fact, that, you know, that we see this development in the mathematics to Ptolemy, but which came first, the gear wheels or the explanation? And that's a grey area. More research, I think, will be done on that area to know whether that some of this sort of that the mathematics was inspired mechanically rather than mechanics being ins inspired uh, mathematically. So uh, we don't know, but th there's a sniff, again, that there's some sort of association between the mathematics and the gearing. The Roman calendar of that time, which could be true, does this mechanism feed into concluding it or wait until he did what he's doing with that? Interesting question. Uh, Probably not. This, this had its own particular calendar. It, it worked particularly on the Egyptian calendar, which is what the astronomers used, because that was a better fixed calendar for doing things in astronomy. Uh, as you say, around the Mediterranean <coughs> world, they're all different calendars. Uh, and I think calendar reform would have come through civil negotiations or decree uh, and talk with astronomers. But I don't think the, the actual machines themselves would have actually been involved in calendar reform. Right. Uh, literally reference, we've got, are there any other machines? No. Alas, we'd love to find another one. Uh, the reason we haven't found any more is, is, is quite understandable. There was a huge market in second-hand bronze around the classical world. If a thing broke, and one of these things would break after a while, it would have been melted down and reused. If it wasn't done in classical times, it would have been done during the Middle Ages and ended up in a cannon barrel. Okay. <coughs> So anything like that, unless it was precious, had precious metal and, and was you know, beautiful or whatever, it wouldn't have been preserved. So th 
It's not surprising they don't survive. This survived because it was on a shipwreck. But there, there could be other ones. For example, I don't know if Pompeii and Herculaneum are eventually properly excavated, whether there'll be one there. Possibly somebody might have one there. We're always hoping for something to turn up. The trouble is, until recently, as I say, this was just a lump of corroded bronze. You know, I, who's going to recognise that as something really important? It was luck that it was recognised and kept. So there may have been other ones found, but just tossed away. But please, if you have one at home, <laughs> do let us know. It would be lovely to find more. Okay, great. Thanks.